Hello and welcome to the Virtualization Cloud Security video podcast episode of the 160, Billion. something like that. It's pretty long. Um, this started out as a regular podcast and we switched to video um, but, uh, middle last year and you can find it all on the virtualization practice. I'm here with Mike Foley who is in the techno, technical marketing for vSphere security. What, what is it your role is these days? I work in the Cloud Platform Business Unit, which is essentially vSphere, and I work in the tech marketing group, and my focus is on vSphere security, not network slash NSX security. In other words, the actual infrastructure. system, infrastructure, not, well, networking is considered infrastructure, but you're talking about the actual compute yep. platforms, not the networking right. platforms. Hypervised their level security and security operations in virtual machine, some some virtual machine security. Sure. Yeah. Of which you put out the, you're the author of the current hardening guide for vSphere. That's correct, yeah. Have there been any updates there? Uh, not since the 6.0 release. Okay. I'm not anticipating any until a future release. And I just put out my secure hybrid cloud reference architecture version two which has made room for all sorts of interesting things. You, you got a chance to look at it beforehand. I think you sent it to me. I don't know if I've had a chance to look at it. I've been, um, how shall I say, slammed in the past, <laughs> the past so few months. I, um, just so you know, the key, key new things into it is mostly a lot of the changes were really semantic, not architectural. Uh -huh. um, a lot of name changes, a lot to keep up with the technology where we were looking at introspective API, introspective firewalls. We've now, I've now changed that to being different terminology. Introspective firewalls are still there, but it's really a, a subcomponent of what most people are calling distributed firewalls today. I find, I find it interesting you're making these type of changes because these sound very similar to some of the changes that I made in the 6.0 timeframe. And I think they come from the standpoint of you and I have probably been doing this more than anybody else in the industry. Yes. And I think we're now starting to figure out better how best to represent this world from a security standpoint. You know, we, we had the way we did it in the past with PCs and so on and so forth. Uh, now we're thinking, I think you know, we've stewed on this an awful lot. And it's like, you know, this would be better represented doing it this way rather than that way. And it's more, and to be honest, in order to keep up with what's happening, a lot of it's just name changes. It's not a change to the way we think about it. It's more of a change to the way that everybody else classifies it they say oh right. that's this and also by going to something like a distributed firewall definition <laughs> that encompasses introspection micro segmentation um, private vlans it's a broader definition mm -hmm. and that allows us to classify a lot more tools to fit with inside that one bucket it makes it generic enough that when you look at the an architecture doesn't look like it's oh vSphere specific or Hyper V specific or you know Amazon specific. It's right. it's everything you got, and that's the semantical changes I made were to do that really. Yeah, but also to introduce the new concepts where I used to call things virtual firewalls. A new change I made was to actually call them in, um, um, internal segmentation firewalls because. I need to be able to expand this not just to the virtual environment, but to the subdivided um, physical world as well. Yep. And the terminology is all the same. I don't want to keep on calling everything an edge firewall when people think of edges as the edge of your network, not the edge <laughs> of a trust zone. <laughs> not, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, all of all of this new technology. Uh, you can't necessarily completely represent with old terminology. Correct. Right. And this is all part of what, based on things you and I have learned and looking at the problem going, 
that's really not the best way to represent this. Exactly. And that's why and then, we made the changes. Yeah. Um, other things that were changed is I actually expanded the storage security quite a bit to include not only discussions about, you know, the standard protocols, fiber channel, iSCSI, NFS, but to include local storage so that we can handle things like vSAN and other yep. type of storage hypervisors, but also um, the Mellanox um, InfiniBand 10G networking that could be fiber, could not be, and PCIe extenders so that you have support for you need to know how to secure all these things. You can't. Yep. Storage is one of those areas where security is kind of like uh, it's separated. That's all we do. Right. But for the management plane, you can actually put in an, inter an internal segmentation firewall. For the data plane, there are other things you could do. You don't want to put a firewall in there, but you do want end to end encryption for data in motion and things of that nature. You also have to handle all the caching layers, and they're all throughout storage these days. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things that 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 brings up an interesting uh, question that I get an awful lot of, uh, about. Um, you know, I need to be able to scrub the disk of the VMDK on uh, that's living on that data store. What what type of erasure pattern and so forth should I use? And I'm like you're still talking as if everything was running on spinning rust. You start talking about SSS, SSD, forget it. You need erasure coding. Well, the thing is, with if you do, if you do overwriting on an SSD, you're wearing out the disk prematurely. Yes. Right. So, what's the bigger risk? So that's one of the things around. Where would it? What would be a better way to do this from an IT operations standpoint? Um, you know, I would foresee. If we had VMDK level encryption, um, that you could just throw away the key, throw uh, essentially shred the key, yeah. using using a a, um, a a a a reasonably secure method. Uh, some for some customers that may not be good enough, but for most it would probably be just fine. Of uh, and at that stage, you've taken the erasure of that system out of the hands of IT and put it promptly into the owner of the key management system, which is probably the security guy. Which is really where it should be. Exactly. Exactly. And that all comes down to, okay, so, you know, we had this big upheaval that virtualization and cloud is, have given us. And now the dust, I think, is starting to settle and we're starting to figure out better ways to do things, better ways to describe things and where the roles are changing. Exactly. And one of the other things that we've added into and this actually was based on some of the stuff that you and I've talked about in the past. I made a change to the architecture to include a key management system with capability so yep. that I can manage and having key management, sub key management systems in clouds so that you have a, a unified key structure for your whole hybrid cloud. Because if you don't, managing that's a nightmare. Yeah. And yeah. In, in I mean, one of the has been a nightmare for years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I tell folks is if, um, if the day comes that you're going to have um, a lot of encryption in a virtualized environment, and you're going to be leveraging key management servers, then you probably really ought to be considering, okay, what is my disaster recovery plan for those key management servers? You got What's my high availability? How can I ensure that if data center A gets destroyed by a tornado that I can bring up encrypted virtual machines and data center B? And if your key management server is, co if your one key management server is co-resident with you, with data center A, you may be screwed. Yeah, and, and you'd have to recreate everything. But but then again, then that gets into the whole conversation about, okay, do I recreate everything using continuous integration, continuous deployment, DevOps, Agile, right. with, with containers, whatever container it is, whether it be a virtual machine or a Docker or whatever, 
or do I actually just have it all ready, ready and waiting to just be turned on? Do I do the deploy and re-encrypt? Or do I have the keys and I can redeploy, re just push the button and say go? It's the right. whole, you know, in, in vSphere terms, it's the SRM versus next generation of applications discussion. Sure. It's been going on for years. Yeah, and, and it's not going to change because there's always going to be a mix. The, You know, at, I have yet to see in my 30 plus years of being in this business, anyone turn around and say, starting next week, we're going to completely rip and replace all of our stuff with new stuff. And we're going to have no old stuff as of next week. No, the old stuff lives for Unless there's a disaster decades. that wipes it out, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where you need to start thinking about keys as part of identity. Yeah. That's the whole PKI discussion. It's the whole policy discussion. But it really boils down to is that if you are going to think about a model for moving to the cloud, which actually at InfoSec World, that is my my discuss, my um, talk is a model for moving to the cloud. And it's based on all the stuff we've been talking about now. It's like you got to think about X and Y and, and data protection and DLP and identity and key management and authentication and authorization and you know logging and analytics. Oh my God, there's so many things. I, I used I would tell folks who are fans of Doctor Who that the you know when they say we need to make this secure, it's like okay, go over and walk over to that blue police box that says security across the top. And open the door and I will show you security. And you will find that it is a much, much bigger conversation on the inside than it is on the outside. <laughs> it really is. But there were, and that's why I put together this model. And I actually presented like 10 minutes of it at VMworld last year for V Brown Bag. Anybody wants to, they can go up and look at it. But the idea is, is that at least getting people to start thinking about what are the pieces they need if they are going to go to a hybrid cloud and what they need, where they need to put things, how they need to share it. You know, you can't just say, I'm going to put an app up into Amazon and be done. Not anymore. Yeah. I mean, with the number of breaches that are happening, that just doesn't fly anymore. Yeah, you really have to. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, I just deployed the coolest new, new gizmo and, oh, look at the benefits it's bringing to the business. You can't do that without talking about governance of that. Exactly. And what it means to the business if it's compromised, what it means to the business if that cloud disappears overnight, you know, Joe's cloud and transmission box uh, system. Uh, I mean, I do, re I do recall hearing a story of a customer that had deployed, deployed a VM to the cloud and when their auditors started hunting down where this VM was, it was running as a virtual machine on VMware Workstation on a box underneath some dude's desk in India somewhere. Yeah. That was their cloud. That is not a good idea. <laughs> you really have to have a better handle. It's, it's really cool for your dev guys to just go click, it's running. I, I totally, totally get that. And that has a, a, a total G whiz factor. It does enable, you know, being able to enable stuff to happen faster. Totally with that. And that's actually but you why you can't do that at the expense of the business. And that's why at Cloud Security World, I'm doing a, a, a seminar on a secure continuous integration, continuous deployment model mm -hmm. based on, you know, yeah, I want the developers to be able to say click and go. But there's a lot more involved from a security perspective and a testing perspective for all the different attacks that are happening. And this model, I'm still evolving. I mean, even yesterday I was speaking to Andy Mann and we've added in a new thing. I actually added into my model since I'm doing security testing, I actually added in a threat feed, threat feed so that you can actually say, what's the most important test to run today? Mm -hmm. Because, hey, the threat feed says, you know, cross-site scripting for banks and your bank happens to be prevalent. <laughs> you know, that's the one you need to focus on. Right. 
you don't need to focus on, you know, there's a buffer underrun in some code somewhere that no one's ever going to hit. Right. So you need a way to use, you can use threat feed information in development, in testing, in automated testing to say, hey, even though we notice all these problems, it gives me a severity level for the ticket I'm going to open or to increase the severity based on current threat information is an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. And that's another use for threat feeds in development that most people aren't even thinking about. Yes. Yeah, I actually had an idea at one point of um, being able to take a threat feed and modify vShield rules in real time. That would be very cool. That would be extremely cool. Now you'd have to do NSX rules, but... Sure. It still would be... Or you can do any distributed firewall, which should be, be able to do that. Right. Do you... I mean, I know at RSA next week... Yep. Is I'm going to run into, in the Innovation Sandbox and everywhere else, a huge number of threat-sharing platforms. There's, um, there's hundreds of them now. But like you, there were hundreds of firewall vendors two years ago? Well, there's still hundreds of firewall vendors. They're all there. And there's hundreds of identity vendors. You can't get away from those either yeah. at RSA. But have, do you know of any vendors that are actually doing what you described, where they're able to take the feed and immediately make rules out of it? I don't, I don't live in the network security space, so I really don't. I have my hands so full with the platform security space you know, the infrastructure security space, you know, hypervisor level, um, I I pay virtually no attention to the, the network side. And to be honest, I don't know one that does that. If you talk a good story, a lot of them can be pulled into automation suites to do that. You can do it by yourself. I haven't seen any real good examples. I mean, it, it should be as simple as um, getting a JSON feed from a a, a a manager of threats, right? A JSON feed of, of IP addresses and feeding them into the firewalls via API. Well, you don't really want to do IP. You don't really want to do a huge number of rules. I think that the whole thing is to really pick and choose the rules you really want and not to put them at the IP level. Because if you do it at the IP level, you could end up with a million rules in a heartbeat doing this. Mm -hmm. Really, what you want to do is bring it up another layer and multiple layers up so that you get a better use of rules so that they're more generic. So if you notice that your traffic should not be coming from Uruguay for whatever reason or from Russia or from China or from any even Kentucky, right? Right. You don't feature these. We don't do business in Uruguay, so there's no need for. Exactly. Yeah you should be able to have the rules that say, I want to block by country. Right. And that's just... Instead of the that, 4 million IPs that make that, up that country. That's, that's just a, a level of abstraction, right? But that's what we need because we have too many firewalls today with, with millions of rules. And, no, and we all know nobody removes firewall rules. They only add them. Exactly. <laughs> and that's actually why I introduced into the whole secure hybrid cloud reference architecture is the is the in, um, internal segmentation firewall so that you can actually limit the number of rules to specific trust zones. You don't right. have to have the million that make the whole thing on the edge. You may still have the million, but they're split up amongst where they need to be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it and, and like you said, the you you have trust zones, you probably have a trust zone for, you know, your database and application servers of which they only need to speak with each other. Exactly. So the use of a firewall feed is probably not terribly interesting. But them. knowing whether or not there is, um, for example, there's um, SQL injections and so forth, knowing where those are coming from or ways to mitigate that using other tools from other yep. companies may be valid as well. Yep. So there's all sorts of threat feeds that people that we're, we're this is a arms race. You and yeah. you and I are part of it. It's yeah. the, the, the hackers are in the in the hackers and the tools. Are they are in business. Right up. 
Right. They are in business. They are in business. Yeah. So what do you what do you think is going to be the the big thing, the big, you know, uh, thing at RSA? From all my, there's always something. Yeah, you know, there is always is something. Here, the smart card, again. No, I actually <laughs> usually RSA fluctuates from a year of identity to a year of something else. I Last year was all about identity. I think it'll be still identity. Well. Identity is a huge part of RSA, believe me. We, you and yeah. I both know that. I think the innovation sandbox may be still about threat feeds. Or it could be about more automation, which is what I'm seeing from other companies. But right now, everybody and their uncle is coming up with a report. I mean, I just got a discussion yesterday, and it hasn't been released yet, but um, I did an article on the virtualization practice that and I asked you, like, which are the new reports that people should be looking at? Mm -hmm. I asked everybody, and the first one out of everybody's mouth was the Verizon DBIR. It's like, yeah, it's the granddaddy of all reports. Read it, right? Yeah. It's really good. But I've been looking at some other ones that are been coming out, like Mandiant has one, Trustwave, even Bromium has one, you know. They're very specialized and very specific, but there's a new breed that I, I've seen of they're generically asking about security people what they consider to be most important. There was one that I got that was actually done by an email company, and they just asked generically about security and what people are looking out for. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing was malicious insiders. Well, you would think um, uh, an email company, the number one thing would be phishing attacks. But it wasn't. They, were, they weren't asking about email. They were asking generically about security. And then I looked at another report that said the exact same thing. But the Verizon DBIR, its number one thing is not malicious insiders. What is it? It's still partners. Hmm. Partner access is almost worse because you don't know what the security is on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting to hear the the malicious insiders because that's that's what we hear an awful lot from IT people, right? You know, they're worried about the disgruntled employee. They're worried about uh, an insider level attack uh, uh, taking down their infrastructure. And then you know we've talked with I, with security professionals, and they're off on a whole other different plane. Well, they are because the malicious insider is not a, it's the high dollar amount, but they have enough controls in place to kind of make ensure data protection and things like that. But they are on a different plane. I think the malicious insider, yeah, high dollar, you should prevent it, but proper role based access controls will take care of that. Yeah. And proper HR practices that when you let someone go, you remove all their accounts. Yeah, and that's and that's where I think you'll really start to see. I mean, we we had it a couple of years ago, kind of fell by the wayside. The whole identity access management play. Well, and there's a million and one of those. You'll see those at oh, yeah. RSA. They're all they're scattered throughout the show floor. You want one, you can find one. Yeah, I mean, we've got one. Everybody has one. You know, what I'm interested in is. SSL hygiene, there's only a few companies that do that. You know, there's so many bad mechanisms for implementing SSL, you know, <laughs> that everybody uses those bad mechanisms because they don't know any better. Right. You know, but then you have the benefits of the world and other companies that actually do management of this. But this is also where a really good key server comes into place. A key management server can manage those certificates for you and ensure that they're pre-shared appropriately yeah i think one of the things people fail to recognize is that um the the target of attack shifts as technology changes yes right so um you know a couple of years ago all your ssl certs are just files stuck in a uh, uh, a file system folder somewhere and now we're into solutions managing all of your SSL certs and that shifted the attack from let me get to that folder to get that cert 
to let me now go after you know the grand poobah that's managing all of the certs exactly and i see the same thing in the virtualization space where it was well i need to get i i'm a bad guy and i want to get access to that database well now if i just get access to the hypervisor level controls i i can not just pull records out of a database i can pull the whole not just the whole database, I can pull the whole application and everything else and run that. It, it you, you shifted it from the data to the IP. And not only that, I mean, if you think about that, even with that, there's technology that helps solve all those problems. Yeah, yeah, it, it, I, I guess I'm just pointing out that as we go into more solutions that consolidate um functions like your your SSL yeah. solution consolidating the management of all certs the the uh threat payoff of hacking just that oh yeah is far greater than going after individual servers true so the threat vector of of attacking a vCenter or, or ESX hypervisor or any hypervisor or control plane is huge because now you essentially get access to everything. I mean, if you think about it, there's also still 21 server uh, hypervisor attacks out there that we know of today. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to change. They're going to grow. Yeah. And those are just the ones that are available in Metasploit. <laughs> right. Not the ones that no one knows about that aren't right. in there. But there's, there's a lot, and that's what we need to think about is, and that's why I'm really big on ensuring that there's a lot of security testing going on. I'm hoping I see a lot more of that at RSA. I know that there's only two or three companies that I know of that are doing it, but I'm hoping there's more. Yeah, well, what I think what, what I see is while these products can be pretty darn secure if you manage them poorly or you ma manage the access to them poorly. I don't care what technology you put in there. If I can get the credentials of an admin, it's game over. And that's why these anti-phishing and, and, and identity plays that are going to be showing up at RSA are so important. Yep. But I also, um, one of the things that I've noticed is that there's going to be a large number of security awareness companies there. I've been getting lots of emails from them, and I've actually signed up to talk to a few. I'm wondering if they're trying to do awareness by looking at it from, oh, you need to protect the organization, to, oh, you are a consumer, let me show you how to protect yourself. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's any type of movement in that direction, and I don't know. So I'll be going to a uh, um, a private function uh, Saturday after RSA, and there's usually a lot of pretty high level people at this this function. I'm I'm really curious. I'll I'll be really curious to kind of sit back and listen in on all of the conversations around things like the iPhone scandal that's going on right now. I've been thinking about that one it's myself and I think that will be a huge topic of conversation at RSA. I think it's going to be massive and but I've never been a proponent of, in, of encrypt everything. I just have not because of those problems. The when you start thinking about everything that could go wrong, it's better to not. You know what I mean? Well, um, do we have time to get into the the iPhone thing briefly? And I think we should keep it brief because there's so much to think about this one. And my take on it is. Regardless of what the FBI says, that this is not designed to set precedent, it sets precedent in the legal system. Full stop, Absolutely. period. Anybody that thinks otherwise is fooling themselves. They don't understand the U.S. legal system. They will not understand 
the legal systems of other countries. It sets precedent just because it's there. Yep. I also think that what the FBI is requesting, while not unreasonable to get help, is unreasonable to require Apple to put in a back door or to even create the software. Yeah, I mean, from what I've read so far, um, had they called Apple in the beginning, Apple would have given them the proper steps in order to retrieve the iCloud backup, which Apple can be subpoenaed for. Yes. Um, and it, they would have been happy to to help them with that. Unfortunately, someone told someone who had possession of the phone and possession of the iCloud account to change the password on the iCloud account. At that stage, the phone could not back up. They had already dismantled the Wi-Fi and let all the reporters run all over the crime scene. Um, they essentially shot themselves in the foot, and now they're turning around to Apple saying, remove the bullet and, by the way, you know, make it happen now. Yes. Apple, is, Apple is saying, we're not going to create a version of iOS that allows you to circumvent um and be able to brute force attack the pin code that's on the phone because if we do it once you'll want it all the time well it's not and just that, that. Well, once they do it it'll leak out it, it, it sure it well once they do it they've proven they can do it it will leak out um the the whole issue someone said well they can just get a warrant for you know for someone doing that i said yeah you know, and then someone said, but it's a national security issue. I said, right. And there is a complete and total huge stack of national security letters that were generated, you know, post 9-11. Uh, those can be printed off and rubber stamped at any time. Exactly. So you're opening Pandora's box. And I don't, and, and you are putting in jeopardy um, whole industries because it's not going to stop with a phone. No, right? it's not. It's going to go further and further and further. I don't know. I don't personally, this is the whole should things be encrypted? Should they not be? Some things should be encrypted, most things should not be. But most people don't go through the effort to classify everything to say whether or not that's the case. Well, right, because that's it's far easier to just say, well, encrypt everything. And then I then I pass my audit and off I go. Exactly. And that's just a step instead of actually going through the effort to think about what's public versus private. Unfortunately, this needs to be the end of our discussion. I know it's a right. short one, um, but everybody, thank you for listening in. Mike, thanks for having it. And we'll. I think this one I want to talk continue after our say so I can figure out what's going think about what everybody's going to be talking about there. I think it's going to be big, 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 big discussions. Yeah, I think um, post our say, give us a week or two to kind of compile it all in our heads. And I think it'll make for a very interesting podcast in a couple of weeks. All right. Thanks again, Mike. Have a good day. See you next week.